All right. Welcome to your first lecture of CSD 215. I am going to try to leave the doors open. Hopefully the hallways aren't too loud. I just had this lecture just before this period and it hit 34 degrees in here with the doors closed. Air conditioning's not working. So it's gross and it was really gross in here earlier because once you put in 80 some odd bodies and close the doors, it was a little steamy. Um, hopefully I don't have to close the doors. And I'm gonna go over the course overview first. If you've already had a lecture with someone else, you've experienced this kind of thing already. It takes about half an hour. Um, I'll give you guys the, uh, the two cent tour of uh, Brightspace, how where things are in Brightspace for this course. And then uh, I'll dive into this week's lecture material. So we're gonna describe the course and its components, uh, general expectations, um, specific expectations. Um, explain the grading criteria and process and uh, review the assessments for each component. Uh, this slide makes it sound like we're gonna go in super amount of detail, we're not. I didn't write, I didn't make these slides, I'm using the, you know. There is seven sections of 8215 this summer, I mean this fall. So we're all using more or less the same slide decks. So they're, you know, a little something. All right, so my contact details for the theory prof. My name is Daniel Goudreau, I go by Dan. You will notice there's no letters after my name. I don't have a degree. So I've been known to answer to prof, I've professor into Dan. Um, and uh, that slide is wrong. If you guys actually have, I have you guys for 341, not 331. Forgot to update the damn slide for this one group. Uh, email address is there. Appointments. Um, if you need to talk to me outside of class, send me an email. I'll try to book a time. It'll be a Zoom meeting. Um, I'll explain why in just a moment while I only do Zoom for office hours because I don't have office hours. Um, also, anybody who's in Cal, uh, if I've not received your Cal stuff yet, uh, you know, you may want to reach out to your Cal people and Try to get that moving. I have received a lot, but not, you know, I'm sure there's more coming in. All right, I'm going to give you guys a bit of background about me. Um, I graduated from Canada College in 96. For those of you that don't know where that is, that's in North Bay. Um, it's been a bit. It's been a hot minute since I graduated college. Um, my program was specific to computer programmer ana analysis. Uh, specific, specifically business systems. Um, I've been working as a professional developer ever since. I have been unemployed a grand total of maybe four or five weeks since 1996. It's a good industry to be in, as long as you're not too picky at first. First year or two, it's gonna suck. After that, it gets better. Um, I work full-time and I teach part-time, which is why I do only Zoom office hours, because I work four to 37, 40 hours a week at another job on top of teaching. Um, I've been teaching for, actually that's, should be saying 17 years. I've been a teaching part-time in the college for 17 years now. I've been teaching this course specifically for 15 of those 17 years. Uh, I've been doing this for a while. Um, I currently work for a company called Catlink Technology. Um, it's a division of Fiery Canada. Uh, we were bought out last year. Um, I am a full stack web developer and AWS admin. Uh, for those of you that don't know what that means, that means I do everything from database design to UI design to everything in between, and also set up all the infrastructure to serve this stuff up on the internet. Uh, it basically, if it has anything to do with serving stuff up on the internet, I've probably touched it. Um, so yeah. So what kind of person am I? Uh, I tend to have a very loose, an easygoing teaching style. Uh, you'll never see me use class notes. I have slide decks to remind me what I need to talk about. Uh, I've been doing literally what I'm teaching you guys for since 1996 for a living. Uh, I know the material very, very, very well. Uh, so you'll never see me with lecture notes or you know things, a script or anything. I just It just happens. Uh, I've been told I can be sarcastic, yes. Enough said there. Um, I understand that life happens, but I don't suffer fools. So life happens. 
I understand life happens. Or as other people like to say, shit happens. And that's okay. Something happens, email me. That's cool. I don't have a problem with that. It's when it keeps happening over and over and over again. That's when I start having problems with you. Uh, like a former student I've had where their dog peed on their laptop three times. And it was the truth because they literally showed up with a different laptop every time. And I said, you got to prove it to me. And they literally took a picture of the dog taking a piss on a laptop. I'm like, whatever. But honestly, maybe you should just not leave your laptop on the floor. Um, that's, you know, you're not getting extensions anymore. Right? You go, you used your, your free pass after the second one. Um, so within reason, yes. Just don't, don't, just don't push your luck. Um, I've been told I'm an, uh, an equal opportunity offender. Um, by that, that means that, um, I have been known to, uh, call out students in class. Not to answer questions, uh, because A, you're being dumb, B, you're being irritating, or three, you just caught my attention. Uh, I'm not mean, I just, everybody gets to have it. It's, I don't pick after specific people. And I don't mean it in an offensive manner. And this is where I always say, if I said something during class time that you really didn't like, let me know and I'll make sure not to use those words again. It's just happened before, I've been called out on it, and I've never reused those particular examples or phrases. Um, just saying. We're all human. And I'm old enough that, you know, stupid shit comes out of my mouth all the time. Okay. Uh, contact details for your lab prof. Uh, there is three lab sections for this group. Um, you're going to find that stuff in Brightspace. When I give you guys a tour, you'll see where it is. It is what it is. Um, email protocol. So this is a generic slide that all the profs have, at least for this course. It says, I'll try to answer you within 48 hours. Uh, I tend to answer a heck of a lot faster than that. Um, I've had times where I've answered at three o'clock in the morning because I was sitting in the basement playing video games and my phone went off and I'm like, I can answer that. So don't guarantee it, but I probably will answer pretty quickly most of the time, usually within a few hours. Use your Algonquin email address to send it. That is important because sometimes our mail server will flag your email as being a spam if it's coming from an external address. So if it comes from your Algonquin Live email, it will always reach my inbox. If it's coming from a hotpants65 at hotmail.com, good chance it's not going to make it in. Um, just saying. Okay, uh, ignore the percentages here. I'll go over the percentages later. Um, this semester, we're starting a new lab structure. Uh, it's going to be a little rough for, at first as we're breaking them in. Um, somebody higher up the food chain in our department decided that uh, lab attendance is mandatory. Um, and part A must be done during the lab period. Part B is done after, um, which means I will be taking attendance in lab and your lab profs will also probably be taking attendance, whichever way they decide to do it. I got a sign up sheet. Um, part B is best an extension of part A. So you do the work for part A, then you do part B. Um, you got to make sure you submit part A by the end of the lab period on time. Um, and part B before the labs actually do, uh, at least for lab one, I've, when my group yesterday went through it, almost the entire class finished parts A and B during class. So they didn't have anything to do at home after. Uh, there's going to be two assignments. One's going to be due week seven, the other one on week 14. Um, the course is arranged in such a way that you will have zero material to do during reading week. Or the fall break, I guess it is. So basically put, you know, you get the assignment done and that kind of stuff and you're done. You just don't need to think about this course for a week, which is nice. Um, both assignments are going to be submitted on Brightspace. They're going to be demoed during the lab session for a grade. 
Uh, the demo is not actually worth any points. But if you don't demo, you get an automatic zero. Uh, the reason we do the demos is in the past, people used to use services like Chegg to do the work for them. But we really couldn't prove it until we started doing demos. And then we'd have people come in with their lab and I show them the document of their lab and they got this blank look like they've never seen it before. It's just to verify you've done the work yourselves. That's what the demo is for. Uh, historically, at least my demos are usually under five minutes. It's like you come in, we talk about your shit, you leave. So it's usually pretty quick. Uh, depending on your lab prof, depending on how they decide to do the demos, uh, I think you guys, there's Grace and Fedor, I think is his name. I'm not sure how they're going to do the demos, but mine are really quick. Um, lectures are going to be conducted in the designated classroom here. Hopefully, air conditioning will be working next week. Um, attendance is important. Um, this is where I'm going to do a quick aside. Because, of course, although attendance is important, um, you may have noticed I'm wearing a microphone. And I've got a fancy little webcam right there. I record my lectures. I'm the only one that does at present. I am going to keep doing it until somebody tells me to stop. Uh, I've been doing it for 12 years now, so hopefully, you know, nobody ever tells me to stop, but we're going to go with it. As you probably all received that email yesterday, you know, talking about, you know, if you're sick, stay home, blah, blah, blah. I'm a big believer in if you're sick, don't come and sit with your classmates. Especially in a lecture hall like this, where there's 80 of you, and then you got somebody sneezing in the middle. You know, the 25 feet around that person, they all got the dose, right? Um, so if you're snotting, coughing, licking doorknobs, whatever it is you're doing, if you're sick, go home. My recordings are usually posted within 24 hours. All you're going to miss is the ability to ask questions real time. Um, but that being said, the fact that I record my lectures doesn't excuse you from coming to lecture. It just means please don't come if you're sick. Because if you're not here, you can't ask questions. You can't direct the flow of the lecture. If you have a question that might trigger you know, something worth discussing. If you're not here, it's just not going to happen. Um, midterm exam will happen in this room in week seven during lecture. Uh, the final exam will be in person somewhere. Uh, that's going to be announced later uh, because all seven sections of this course are writing at the same time. I guarantee that at least a few sections, uh, well, 80, four sections will be writing in the gym. And the other three sections probably writing in the cafeteria. If it goes like it usually does. Um, because it looks like we have about 90 students per section. It's somewhere between 85 to 90 students per section. We have seven sections, so it's a lot of students. Uh, we're all going to be writing the same exam, more or less. Um, okay. <laughs> Whatever kind of stuff we're going to have, we're going to have lectures, obviously, uh, software demos. Um, so just so you know, your lab profs are not supposed to teach you new material. Okay? They're not there to lecture you. They're there to help you understand um, the material you're supposed to be working on. They're there to help you learn. So if you have questions about what you're trying to do, that's what they're there for. They're not there to teach you a whole new concept. Just putting it out there. If you missed a lecture, they're not there to supplement the fact that you missed a lecture. Um, in the second half of this term, I'll be spending a lot of the lecture sitting down uh, because I'll I tend to do my I tend to the second half is very hands on. And I tend to do basically a big long demo that covers like eighty percent of the slides. So then I'll go then I'll just start going through the slides really quick, going to see if I missed anything. Um, there's going to be some reading tasks. Some practical tasks. I'll be practicals your labs. Reading tasks. I'll be handing out uh, reading uh, things you should be reading every week. 
Um, and you're going to want to revi review a little bit as you go. This is the textbook. Uh, you guys are a computer programmer. Uh, it's worth getting it for you guys because you're going to be using it level two also. So it is put in as a recommended text, if I remember right, for 8215, not a required text, which means it's not automatically included with your tuition. But it might be worthwhile grabbing it. Honestly, if you can find a copy of the 15th edition, uh, most of the content is off by one or two pages. It's all the exact same stuff. There's like, I couldn't tell the difference between 15th and 16th, except it was an extra 90 bucks and I couldn't find it on the internet. Yar. If you know where to look for textbooks. Um, you're not supposed to pirate textbooks. Shoot, I wasn't supposed to record that. <laughs> Anyways, that's okay. Um, and if you don't know where to re to download textbooks, so trust me, it's not hard to find. There's at least two really good places. Um, I may provide extra links or extra documents from time to time for you guys to read. Uh, they'll be all on Brightspace. Okay, here's your grading breakdown. You're going to have 10 labs. 25%. I mean, each lab is worth 2.5% of your grade. It doesn't sound like much, but I've had cases where a student decided to not do a lab, and it was the difference between an F and a D. Or it was also the difference between an A and an A+. It's like, if you're skirting the edge of the next letter grade up, those labs are pretty important. Um, honestly, most of the labs can be done in under two hours. So, it's pretty reasonable. Um, there's two assignments, 30%. Um, four hybrid quizzes, 10%. These, again, are worth 2.5% each. Skipping the hybrids is a great way to never get an A+. Because the second you don't do your hybrids, there's no way on earth you're ever going to get an A+. You'll be doing well to get an A. Um, they're not terrible to do. Do you have a bunch of slides you read? It's on your own time. And then I release a... a um, quiz to you guys at a specific time. It's even in the calendar. You can see it. You're going to have like a week to do it. 2.5%. <laughs> so um, you're going to have a midterm exam, 15% of your grade, and the final exam is 20%. So that's the breakdown of how the grades are going. So this is one of those courses where you must pass both components. So you need to have 50% on the theory and 50% in the practical. Um, so that means the hybrid, the midterm, and the final exam, you must pass it combined. So even if you, let's say you fail the midterm by like 2%, but you do really well on the final exam, you're still going to pass because you're going to end up with a higher than 50% theory grade. Don't try to skirt it that close. Um, but you must have 50% in the theory, and then you have to have 50% on your labs and your assignments. Uh, you fail one of the two, you fail the course. Just saying. Um, and literally, if you kind of breathe at the assignments, you're probably going to pass them. <laughs> at least the first assignment is fairly forgiving. Um, it's very clear how the, cra the grades are handed out. So as long as you follow the grading guide, you're going to do fine. And if you do your labs, you're going to do fine. So. I think you're starting to see a pattern here, right? Eh? Just do the work and try to breathe while you're doing it, and you're probably going to be fine. This is not the hardest course. The concepts are hard to understand sometimes, but it's not the hardest course work-wise. Compared to your Java course, this is a breeze. Just saying. Okay. So we're going to introduce you to databases. Uh, the needs and the roles of databases in our world. We're going to explore concepts of database modeling. This is a very shallow course. So I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before. This is a very broad course that's very shallow. We cover a lot of topics, but we don't go in depth. When I went through school, I had four database courses. You guys have actually three because you're in CP. Um, but I literally had two courses just on database design. You get the thing, four weeks. So I had two semesters, you guys are getting four weeks. You can get, an, there's a slight difference in amount of content, right? And you're also gonna learn 
uh, basic SQL. Um, you're actually going to have a fairly good handle on regular queries and that kind of stuff by the end of this term. Um, again, when I went through school, I had one whole course dedicated to SQL. Your level two course will introduce you to some of the more advanced topics that I would have taken in my other courses, for example. And then your level three or four Oracle course covers a lot of really nitty gritty stuff. So you guys are going to get a fairly good thing. It's just this one is shallow. We don't get depth into anything. We just cover a lot of topics. So you have a, a good foundation. Okay, theory. So there's hybrid structure. The hybrid, like I said before, it's a series of slides and quizzes, 10% of your grade. I already discussed this. I'm not going to talk about the slide anymore. Um, peer tutoring. You all get a certain number of hours. I don't know if it's one or three. I don't remember. It changes from semester to semester of hours of tutoring included with your tuition. If you're having a problem, you can go to uh, the Student Learning Center and actually sign up for some tutoring. Uh, usually it's former students that have taken this course before who had a good grade in this course that, that are the tutors. Um, I don't remember how many hours, but you do get a certain number of hours for free included with your tuition. So if you're having a hard time learning something, it might be worthwhile reaching out. Uh, maybe we're sick due to COVID, whatever. That's from like a while ago. Yes, COVID's still a thing, but it's not restricted very much anymore. Uh, we also have a counseling service school. So if you have a rough time in life in general, um, you probably, you can avail yourselves to our services. There's a bunch of different things to help you. So, you know, having a insert kind of session moment here, try not to identify any specific kinds. You can contact counseling services and there's people there to help you with a lot of different situations. So. Just say absences. All right, so send me an email. So if you can't come to lab, send me an email. Uh, I mean, you know, you decided you were going to lick all the doorknobs in the in the residence, so now you're sick as a dog. Just email me. Probably don't want to admit you were licking doorknobs, but you know, you're sick. I don't need a doctor's note. We used to ask for doctor's notes when you had an absence. We no longer do. One good thing that came out of COVID, I don't have to follow up with doctor's notes anymore. But if I come back to that whole, I don't suffer fools bit from way at the beginning of this. If you're sick for seven weeks straight, you probably want to rethink your college career. Uh, you may want to just like, you know, withdraw and try again a bit later once your health improves, because all you're doing is just wasting your money. Um, and I'm after like three weeks in a row, I'm probably going to stop believing you. But that's just how it is, right? Um, yeah, so I don't need proof that you're sick. Just tell, tell me you're sick. And you can't come to lab. That excuse you from the mandatory lab attendance. Um, yeah. All right, Cal students. Um, I've already received a bunch of Cal accommodations. If you're still going through the process of getting Cal accommodations, cool. They'll get to me. If you were supposed to get them and you've been told that you've gotten them, you may want to reach out to me and say, make sure I did receive them. Um, Cal has a lot of resources that you may not realize. Um, like some, there's, they've got some crazy resources available to you uh, if you have any kinds of issues any kind of learning disabilities or learning challenges, let's just say they're not disabilities anymore, or challenges. Um, my daughter goes through Cal. She's here at the college, she's finishing off, off in the CST program. And she went through Cal. And she got noise canceling headphones paid by the school. She got one of those pens that actually records a handwriting that she can plug into her computer and copies her notes to her computer. Really nifty stuff, and the school paid for it. Uh, but you have to have a diagnosis of some sort, and then it has to be applicable. So that includes everything from, you know, ADHD to, you know, your concussion syndrome to whatever else may be there. Um, trust me, milk cow for all it's worth. It'll make your life a heck of a lot easier. And your tuition's paying for it. So, you know, avail yourself of what you can. Okay. Um, 
to be successful in this course, of course, it always says you got to attend all lectures and labs, whatever. Um, lab attendance is mandatory because somebody said it was. Um, ensure that you do all the assessments completely. And it says correctly. And by correctly, we don't mean you did it like you got 100%. It means that you submitted it the way we wanted it submitted. So we say submit a Word document and you send me a Mac Pages document. Guess what? I can't open. M Mac word processor documents do not open on Windows. Just saying. So I mean by correctly means you're going to submit it the way we want it submitted. Read the submission instructions. It's a really stupid way to lose points. Um, plan your time effectively to ensure that no component of the course is neglected. This is where I tell everybody, you're not in high school anymore. Obviously, some of us are a little older than we didn't get out of high school yesterday. But some of you in here will probably be fairly recent. And we don't hold your hands here. So you're responsible for managing your time and making sure that you do the work. Visit the course page. i also one of those weird teachers that actually gives you a summary of everything you're supposed to be reading, doing, and when things are due. Every week, there'll be an announcement that shows you, these are the labs you're supposed to be working on. This is when they're due. This is what you should be reading and anything else of note that came up that I didn't cover in lecture or that I did cover in lecture and I, I said I'd provide extra documents. Every week, we'll be there. Um, there's actually you know a bit of wiggle room, the way this course is laid out timing-wise. It's what they call a 323 course, three hours of theory, two hours of lab, and then three hours of study time. Realistically, that last three hours of study time depends on you. And, you know, if you happen to feel comfortable with the material, maybe reach ahead a little bit so that if something happens, you're already got some of the material under your belt. And keep an eye on, on your due dates for all assessments, uh, because basically the policy for this semester, because we have so many sections and all the profs have to follow the same rules, right, for grading is it's late, it's zero. So if it goes past the due date, you're making my life really easy because I don't have to grade it. I just, it's one keystroke. That's it. Um, like I said, you're not in high school anymore. I am not going to hunt you down. So it's coming up close to a due date. And I noticed that, you know, 50% of the class hasn't submitted their work. I'm not going to go hunt you down. I got better things to do, like playing video games, watching anime or going fishing. I am not going to hunt you down. I work 55 to 60 hours a week. I'm not spending extra time hunting students down that don't want to do their work on time. I'm just being completely frank and honest with you guys. Um, I'll show you guys where these documents are. Uh, these are the academic dishonesty and plagiarism. Uh, the original version of these slides had like four slides about this. Uh, I'm just going to tell you guys, go read these and understand what they mean. Um, and uh, the course section information, they call, not call this the course schedule, but it's it used to be called the CSI. Um, so I'll show you guys the CSI in a minute and where it is. Um, but I, this is where I usually give my two, the, my 30 second explanation of plagiarism. Plagiarism is submitting somebody else's work and saying you did it. That's a pretty short explanation of plagiarism is. I've had a student, I've had a student expelled because they were stupid. They posted one of my exam questions on Stack Overflow and then somebody answered it and he submitted that answer. And dude was like a real rock star because he used his own picture as his avatar and he used his name as his username. He got all three strikes at the same time because there's like a three strike system. He got a strike for providing exam material to an external source, providing answers to an exam question because it was publicly available, and um, and there was another one there. And he got all three strikes in one go. He like, literally he walked in, come and ask a question about. Yeah, so I just walked him from there. Literally, I'd already contacted the chair, and I just walked him to the office and dropped him off. And I literally saw from the window being him and being escorted off the premises. 
Apparently, he they had to get security to make him leave. <laughs> Again, bright. So just this is on my way of telling you a story that's happened. Just don't cheat. Or if you're going to cheat, at least don't be obvious. Like I've had, I have a friend that's got a Chegg account. So for those of you that still use Chegg, I can log in and find whether or not you're submitting my questions because I just search for those questions and they're there. And what we've learned over the years is the guy who answered on Stack Overflow gave a perfectly valid answer in a way that I never taught. So the student still would have gotten a zero for that question. And most of the time when it's answered on Chegg, it's not answered the way we want it anyways. So you use the cheating tools, you get the wrong answer, you wonder why you got the wrong answer, you cheated. Congratulations, you earned it. Okay, so don't forget to do the hybrid tasks. Uh, you have to attend your lab sessions. Um, I will discuss lab attendance in lab, uh, how am I going to make that work, at least try to make it work. Um, start lab one, it's already published. It's not super hard. Um, I did update the instructions for part B. I updated them yesterday because I discovered yesterday since the instructions had been written two weeks before, uh, they released a new version of the software as a release candidate and it, the instruction says, grab the latest version. The release candidate's actually missing like a big piece of what we actually needed. So it's been updated just version 15 of Postgres for the second half. Okay. Now I am gonna do a quick little tour around Brightspace for you guys. Okay, you guys are 340. And I'm gonna go make it look like it's almost like you guys see it. Okay. By now you guys have been in Brightspace. You've probably been into at least one course shell. First thing you see is the announcements. Like I said, every week you're gonna have a little blob of text from me saying this is what you should be doing. Um, other stuff you're gonna find is under content. Um, the course information has, um, this actually has to go away because these are wrong. Um, so these are the plagiarism documents and this is the CSI. The, this is the weekly schedule. It basically shows week by week what we're gonna be covering, like a summary what lab is due, uh, what uh, hybrids are, should be working on, uh, when they're due, that kind of thing, on and on. Uh, it, it's good to know. Um, under that, you've got contact info and class times. It shows where I am, where the other profs are, who your profs are. Um, oh, I guess you guys got Steve. I thought, I don't know why, I thought it was Fedor. Fedor's in the other section. Um, so at least you know where you're supposed to be. <laughs> um, recordings, I'll give you three guesses what goes there. Um, weekly lecture material is where you're going to find all the slide decks I'm going to be using. Uh, you will notice that sometimes my slide decks I'm using in front of the class is slightly different than what's in Brightspace. In Brightspace is the standard slide decks that all the profs are given. Sometimes I'll add one or two slides into my slide deck for topics that, you know, I feel need to be addressed a little better. Or, you know, like the introduction one, the normal slide deck doesn't have the about me part. So don't be like very minor variances between them, but nothing major. Um, your labs will be under lab exercises. Right now you can only see lab one. And for those of you that are curious how you submit lab one, when you there's a two ways to do it you can click on the link and it brings you down to the bottom where you can upload a file if nobody's shown you guys that yet uh it used to be on orientation day they gave you guys a little tour of bright space but uh, from what i got from the other group they did not this semester so that's how you submit stuff assignments will be under assignments hybrids is where all the slide decks are for the hybrids so you can start reading the hybrids pretty much right away um now, to some people have asked, well, how do I get to the hybrid quizzes? And under activities quizzes, they'll show up here as they become released to you guys. Uh, if you want to submit assignments and you don't want to go through that whole big process, you can come through here and it'll show you your your lab and place to submit it. It'll show you if it's been submitted and whether or not it's been graded. 
Uh, just so you know, I, when I grade, I don't grade and release immediately. I will release the grades after the due date. You submit, you get graded once. I don't do regrades. So um, under the calendar, um, right now you just see lab one. As you go on, I will actually get rid of viewing as a learner for a second here. As you go on, you will see all of the other events as the term goes on. They'll start looking like this for you guys as the due dates for everything come up. So as I release the content to you guys, all the due dates will start showing up in here. And that's all the big important parts of Brightspace for this course. So before I continue to today's lecture material, does anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, done. And this is the one I want to do. My introduction took longer than the last class did. Interesting. All right. So we're going to start doing week one material. Week one material is just a big, giant info dump, just so you know. Um, I'm just going to talk about general concepts, nothing specific. The specifics start next week. This is just so you guys have a rough idea of, you know, where you're starting. Um, essentially, the internet runs on databases. Whether you're using a PC, you're using a phone, uh, whatever it is you're using, somewhere along the way, it talks to a database. So a database is an organized collection of logically related data. Um, that's why I said this is like basically a big giant info dump where there's just a bunch of definitions that are going to be thrown at you. Um, so when we want to talk about an organized collection of logically related data, we're talking about sets of information. And an example of that would be um, like this access here at the school. It's got a bunch of related, logically related data. It's got information about teachers, it's got information about students, it's got courses, it's got grades, it's got programs. It's a database of related data. On the other hand, your bank has a different database with information that they care about. The entire, everything is running on databases, it's just not all one giant database, because that's a concept that gives me nightmares. Imagine if your bank, the college, and the government all use the same database. You fart, and the government knows. No, that's not how it works. Or even better, imagine if the bank and Facebook shared the same database. <laughs> there you go. You want to talk about nightmare fuel? There it is. No, each database is self-contained. A database is referred to as a self-described collection of integrated tables. It's a really long phrase. Uh, but essentially, it means that a database, when you create a database, the database itself is self-describing. In other words, inside this database, everything that it needs to know how to create itself is there. And then the tables are integrated because they're you know interconnected with each other. Um, the tables are called integrated because they store data about relations between different rows of data. A good example of this would be, again, access. Hey, last class for those. So, access is a good example. You have students. Students have courses that are assigned to sections, that are assigned to programs, that are assigned to classrooms, that are assigned instructors. These are all different kinds of data, or they're different tables in the system, and they're all connected to each other via relationships. That's why they're called integrated, because they're you can't have one without the other. Um, a database is called self-describing because it contains a description of itself. And this description specifically is called metadata. Um, when you create a database backup, inside that backup is a complete set of instructions to recreate the entire database, structure, and data. The metadata allows you to recreate the structure. The data is the data. 
Um, I literally just finished saying that. So databases are everywhere. Um, the effect on our lives is extensive and literally responsible for many of the services we use daily. Uh, this slide was written a long time ago. Realistically, it's responsible for pretty much everything in your life now. Like everything is in a database, regardless of what you do. Uh, I'm going to go through a few examples of some databases that, you know, I don't know if enhance is the right word, but we're going to go with it. So TV streaming or online TV streaming or video streaming, whatever you want to call it. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, insert other service here. There's a database behind there and it tracks, you know, who the users are, what you've watched, what's on your watch list, what programs you've looked at, what shows you've looked at for the description, not even watch. It knows what you've looked at without actually watching it. Um, it knows where you've been watching from. It's all in there. Like it's all in there. Um, and then that with that, they're able to to mine that data to give you recommendations. So let's just say a quarter of you watched one show, and your quest, let's say twenty five percent of this group has watched five specific shows, and then somebody on this side of the room says, "I'm going to go watch this one show," and then they're going to do analytics thing. <laughs> oh, that person watched this show to the end. Well, we're going to recommend these four other shows because other people also finished it based on the data that's stored in the database. They can do analytics and make recommendations to you based on, you know, what you've done. How many of you have Spotify? Yeah, there we go. Spotify is kind of, cra kind of crazy sometimes, you know, a little spooky on how good it is at finding crap you've never listened to that you're going to enjoy. Uh, I've had Spotify introduce me to all kinds of new bands that I didn't know existed. Same thing. You listen to this and you listen to the whole song, you listen to the whole album, you listen to that song three, four times, and it goes, oh yeah, these other people out in Europe also listen to the same song like 25 times. And they also listen to these songs, I'll suggest this to you, and magically you end up with these really wacky playlists. Um, it's nifty. Um, personal cloud storage, also known as, you know, OneDrive, Google Drive, um, you know, Google photo, your photos from your phone, Apple, whatever the frig it's called in Apple land, um, Amazon photos, those kinds of things. When you browse your files in OneDrive online, you're not browsing a file system. You're browsing a database. You're going, oh, I want to look at the, click on a directory, goes into a directory. There's no file structure. There's no data. There's no structure of any sort at all. It's literally entries in a database that says, oh, by the way, this is in this directory. And the file is sitting in some system somewhere else, totally unrelated. Um, it's cool. Which is where I also put in a quick aside to you guys. With your college tuition, you get access to Office 365, which includes a terabyte of storage online. Abuse it while you're here. Because, you know, if you keep all your class documents, you know, all your source code, all your database diagrams, don't install programs in it, but, you know, everything else in there, and then the dog pees on your laptop. I can honestly say, if I wipe this laptop, I will be back to a functional state in 45 minutes, thanks to OneDrive. Because OneDrive will just sync for your files all back down once you log in. So, what well, you may save your files, they go to the internet. Your laptop gets run over by the bus. You buy a new laptop, you log into it, your files come back down. So use it. It's free. Well, you paid for it, but it's free. It's just, it's not coming out of your monthly, you know, you don't have to pay for it every month. Sports. Okay. Whether you play sports or not, sports is all about stats and giving obscene amount of money to people but mostly about stats. Baseball is insane amount of stats. Um, football, hockey, soccer. I'm sure some of the other sports that I don't know much about, like cricket, I'm sure there's lots of stats in that too. It's all about stats. The database tracks who's on what team, how many times they've caught the ball, how many times they threw a ball, how many times they hit the ball, you know, that kind of stuff. And based on that, you can actually do probabilities so then you go talk to your bookie 
and then give them some money and hope you actually get it right. Um, finances, banks, stock markets, financial sector utilize databases. To be honest, the financial sector is the original driving force behind database. Like they literally, databases were created for financial systems. It was all for money first. Not about invading your privacy originally. It was just all about the money. Well, it's money, but not the same kind of money. That's dirty money. The But originally, it was all for the banks. The banks are the ones that pushed data, database technology so far, so fast. Um, database is interesting because database technology has been more advanced than pretty much every other sector of technology until about 15 years ago. It was always more advanced than everything else. Now, it's the, the rest has caught up. But until about 15 years ago, literally, database was the cutting edge of technology. People didn't realize it, but it really was the cutting edge. I mean, think about it this way. And there's actually a fair amount of mature students in here, so this might actually be examples that some of you will recognize. I am old enough. I remember when I got my first bank card. Because there wasn't bank cards. Right? A lot of the young ones were like, what? There was no, place, no pieces of, no, there was no bank cards. We had bank books, and we had to go to the bank to get money. We couldn't pay. And then I remember the day I could actually use my bank card to actually buy something. Actually, no, I remember the day I could go to the teller and pull money out. I remember the day I could go to a teller in another town and pull money out. That was a shocker for me. Um, yeah, I know I'm only 47, but things have changed a lot in the last 20 years. Nowadays, I can go drive through, tap my phone. I don't need my card anymore. And I can tap my phone and they take my money. So think about that, though, that at one point I could go, I could leave my hometown, drive five and a half hours south to North Bay, walk into the CIBC and withdraw money. And that was before internet existed. Because the banks pushed the concepts of distributed databases. So the way it would work is you deposit money. Within 24 hours, you could see it everywhere else in Canada. Nowadays, you deposit money, you see it everywhere else in Canada in seconds. But back then, it was you'd see it everywhere else in Canada. Actually, it depended which bank you were with. Within 24 hours, you could see it everywhere in the same province. And within the next day, you could see it everywhere else in the country. Um, and nowadays, it's instant. The databases are distributed across the whole country. Um, yeah, finance is a really cool industry. It doesn't sound cool, but how it works on the inside is really nifty. Um, they got a lot of cool tech. And what's really amazing is the fact that half the finance industry still runs on COBOL. No, really. Like all your mortgages and all your student loans, that's probably sitting in some COBOL database somewhere. But you know what? It works. That's, there's a reason they're not pulling the plug on it, because it worked. It's just not very fast, but it does the job. Because, you know, every time you replace something, whatever you replace it with is not always better than what was there before. The government organizations, uh, they were number two on the whole concept of databases. They were very close behind banks. Basically, they watched what the banks were doing. They go, that's a good idea. I remember the days where whenever I need to do anything with the government was I'd have to walk to my whatever local branch of Service Canada, for example, fill, wait in line, fill out a piece of paper. They'd look at it, stamp it, put it in a, in a folio that was going to go out to some... The, four weeks later, you got an answer that you forgot to sign something, right? Now in Canada, you, if you're renewing your passport and you're over a certain age, you don't even have to go in. You could literally do it online. You just upload a new picture. Click, click, click. Databases. And, of course, what is the biggest database, government database in Canada? Anybody want to take a guess? Sierra, good. Last group told me immigration. That's number two. Uh, the immigration services probably have the second largest database. Uh, but the CRA has by far the largest database system in Canada. And if you're curious where it is, uh, take the bus down Heron Road. You'll see the Canada Post building on one side, and you'll see this other building that's surrounded by barbed wire, where there's guys that actually look use cameras to look under cars. 
that's where the data center is. It the building goes up eight stories, but it also was underground eight stories. Uh, yeah, it's cool, but it's also distributed now. That's copied in three other places across Canada. So if you want to flatten it, it's not going to help you. Um, it is very far reaching. It's got some amazing tools. Um, Health Canada has got several very large databases too. They track, you know, results of health care across Canada. Uh, food testing, you know. Hey, they're going to check the slaughterhouse where you've got your beef from. All those inspections are in a database somewhere. Social media. Do I need to talk about databases and social media? I think you probably understand. You do realize, if, for example, Facebook knows everything about you, whether or not you have a Facebook account, right? Doesn't make a difference. They know everything about you. Do you use, you, do you use Instagram? I, exactly. Facebook owns like six of the major uh, social media platforms. WhatsApp? Facebook. Uh, so, you know, even the fact you just surf the internet, if you just happen to pick up a Facebook cookie as you're going, they know everything about you. It is what it is. They can't really do anything about it. They just like collecting data so they can run analytics to figure out how they can sell cheap shit to people and to push bad articles to you. Uh, but yeah, social media, everything is a database. Um, Facebook, back to Facebook actually, uh, Facebook was used by, my, by used MySQL a lot. They were one of the big contributors of improving MySQL. If you can call whatever they did, improving it. But they were one of the big contributors. So they'd fix a bunch of bugs and send it back to, uh, send the source code back up to the MySQL open source group. They'd merge them in. Everybody would get the fixes from Facebook. That's cool. E-commerce. Okay, this is going to be interesting. How many people here have not bought something off Amazon in the last year? One, two, three. Hey? Sure, okay, that counts. You bought If you bought a book, that counts. You gave Amazon your money. So that's funny because the other group was exactly three also. Interesting. Um, data. <laughs> Okay, for those of you that have never bought anything from Amazon, have you bought something online elsewhere? There you go. You've never bought anything online ever in your life. Oh, you have, okay. Yeah, so for the three, there's probably you bought something online elsewhere. Whether you bought it from Best Buy, Loblaws, Radio Shack, or whatever the heck they call themselves now, AliExpress, if you really want some weird crap, Wish, or whatever that new one is that's using child labor. Eh? Tim, we have the ones that are using slaves to make them products. That just came out. Don't buy shit from Timu. It's garbage and it's bad. E-commerce runs on databases. The biggest e-commerce provider in the world, Amazon. Who's got the biggest online database services that you can rent? Amazon, followed by Microsoft. Amazon is a web service company that also sells you shit. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, but they're a real estate company. Yeah. Real estate company that sells you food. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. My, uh, my entire company, the company I work for. Yeah. The company I work for, 100% of our databases are on Amazon. It's cheap. I don't have to do backups. Hey, our database server costs us $25 a month. How's that expensive? That's me sitting at my, at my desk scrolling Reddit for 45 minutes. Come on, that's cheap. A database server, an actual piece of metal database server you put in a rack in your office is $20,000. The rack alone is probably ten grand just to put it in. Then you got the switch in the back that has means that's probably another five grand. And then you need to pay the guy to turn the damn thing on and make sure it works. Trust me, twenty five bucks a month is nothing. And it actually runs faster than that, that piece of crap piece of metal you paid twenty grand for. Yeah, absolutely cheaper. Um, there's some things that Amazon's really expensive, but database is cheap. 
<laughs> healthcare. Healthcare is another one that we have all experienced at some point. Dentist's office are great. Everything's electronic. My dentist's office actually just finished upgrading their systems. It's fantastic now. Like, it's, you know, they just click a button and magically I get like reminders via my te via text message on my phone. It's great. Uh, my doctor's office is the same. Like, they don't even use paper. Like, I need a prescription done. They say, you still with the Rexall at College Square? They go, yeah, 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 yeah. Click. There you go. Prescription's already been sent. It'll be ready probably in two hours. You know. Um, but healthcare is a strange one because there is no integrated healthcare network across Canada, even not even across the province. Like, your records at your doctor's office are not available to the ER. They tried years ago, they, they sank billions of dollars, lined their friends' pockets, and nothing came of it. Because it was corrupt. And that's what I meant by lying to their friends' pockets. They spent $12 billion creating a e-health network that died on arrival. But there's a bunch of people that retired. No, it's not hard at all. You, University of Waterloo actually has a system they sell. They could have just bought the system from University of Waterloo. Other places have done it. We just didn't do it in Ontario or Quebec or Manitoba. I, mean, I think BC has their shit together, but I might be wrong. But uh, healthcare is one of those funny ones. There is systems to do it. They're just not using them. But it will catch up eventually. Weather. Uh, yeah, you guys know weather. It's all numbers. Lots of stats. That's how they do predictions. That's how we know this has been the hottest summer on record. Because they're collecting data and they're comparing it to the data from 100 years ago. Um, yeah, it is what it is. All right, so the purpose of a database is to help people track things that interest them. Facebook wants to know everything about you. CRE wants to know about your money. Your bank wants to know about your money, but not the same way. The school wants to know that you're here. They each have their own database systems that track stuff that they care about. Databases can be sorted in two categories, relational and non-relational. This course is about relational database systems. Non-relational database systems um, was a thing that popped up about, man, I'm getting old. It's recent, 10 years ago. Well, I've been doing this for 20-something years, right? Almost 30 years, so. It popped about 10 years ago, and everybody goes, look, this is the best thing ever. A bunch of people jumped on the bandwagon and realized they really didn't do what they wanted, and they went back to relational database systems. Only if the code is written right. And only if, and then the code is not portable. It, if you write it for Mongo, it's written for Mongo. If you write it for Cassandra, it's only for Cassandra. You write standard SQL on MySQL, there's a 95% chance it'll work on Postgres, Oracle, and Microsoft SQL Server. It's vendor lock-in, eh? Maybe, maybe not. What language are you writing in? Hey, sure, C Sharp will have it. TypeScript, not really. TypeScript's just JavaScript with a fancy name. And this is like, I've been doing web development for 23 years. Trust me, TypeScript is JavaScript. So yeah, don't even try to sell that one to me. That's snake oil. So non-relational has a purpose. It's often used as an intermediary. So you you check out a shopping cart, it goes in a non-relational system. A little bit later, there's a process that grabs that data and actually puts it into a relational system. Because you can't actually run reports properly off non-relational. It's like you're saying, hey, I've got, I got everybody in here to write me a Word document that describes them. I want your name, your date of birth, your address, your email address, but I don't tell you how to format it. That's no SQL. Then I take all those Word documents and I'm going to search for people. On the other hand, I give you a document that literally has specific spots you fill things in. That's a relational database system. Large data sets are referred to as big data. Uh, that always makes me laugh when I read that phrase. That's bu marketing buzzword. Uh, basically, they're saying, we have a lot of data, so it's big data. We have more than 10 million rows. It's big data. No, it's data. 
I mean, our database at my day job, our main database that contains a lot of our information, like we have a table that's sitting at 45 million rows, one table. Two other tables are close to 20 million rows each. They have 20 years of data in them. It does the job. Is that big data? No, it's just data. But technically, it's big data. So data is stored in tables, which have rows and columns, um, much like a spreadsheet. So last group, I said, hey, how many of you guys have used a spreadsheet? Whether it's Excel or Numbers or something else. Google Sheets. How many of you use a spreadsheet? There, good. Be honest. There's, it's not a dirty word. You can think of visualizing a database table similar to a spreadsheet. A database will have multiple tables where each table stores data about a different thing. So in Access, there is a bunch of tables. You've got a table with students, you've got a table with staff, you got a table with courses, programs, semesters, sections. There's tables for everything. And each table has slightly different things, but they're all kind of interrelated to each other. But thus, it's a relational database. Um, each row in a table stores data about an occurrence or an instance of a thing of interest. This is where I point out, okay, in Access, we have a table that contains student information. You're an instance, you're an instance, hopefully you people are instances too. An instance, so you have a table, the table describes something, it tells you, this is what I want to know about a student. I want to know their name, their date of birth, their government identifier of some sort, whether it's a passport number, SIN number, you know, student visa number, whatever it is, address, that kind of stuff. So that is the metadata that we want. An instance is a unique collection of that information. So everything about you, one instance, you're a row. Everything about you, you're a row. You're an instance. I'll be talking more about instances next week, but that is essentially what an instance is. It's a snapshot of one specific set of co a collection of information for one thing. And a database stores the relationships between these instances. So for example, in this room, we have at least three, four relationships that describe this group, right? You got a prof, I'm an instance. There's 80, 87 instances of students. There is a course instance. There is a room instance. There is a course section term combination. And then there's the connection of the student to the course section term and me connected to a course section term, the room connected to the course section term. So you have all these instances connected by relationships. That is a relational database explained in fairly simple terms. And a last class, I had a student say, can I give them a visual example? Filing cabinet. Filing cabinet's the database server. The drawer is a database. Each of the file folders is a different table. Each piece of paper in the file folder is an instance. If you want a visual way to see it, it's really not how it is, but that's as close to the real world as I can help you visualize it. <laughs> and I'm going to have at least 25% of this group has never seen a filing cabinet in their life. You know, in probably five years, I won't be able to even use that as an example anymore. I had other examples, and I can't use them because they're not valid anymore. Um, the other example I used to use was uh, card files. How many of you are old enough to remember, and I, I'm going to guarantee nobody in here, is old enough to remember how libraries used to be? You'd go in, you're going to try to find a topic, you'd go, oh, here's the filing thing with the topics. And you'd slide open this big long door and you'd look through the cards alphabetically until you see D for dinosaurs. And then you'd have like five or six cards and it would give you the Dewey Decimal numbers. Then you'd take those numbers right down on a piece of paper and go look on the shelf to see if it's still there. That was an old version of a database. That's what databases, yeah, that's literally what databases do. It's just, now it's been replaced electronically. And actually the paper ones were better than the electronic ones half the time. All right, so databases create information. Data is recorded facts and figures. Information can be defined as knowledge derived from data, data presented in a meaningful context, data processed by summing, ordering, or averaging. It's This slide's a little inaccurate because information happens before and after data. You have unorganized information. That's information in the wild. The information in the wild gets collected, put into a database, it becomes data. Then it gets processed, it becomes 
organized information. So knowledge derived from data, that's a fairly straightforward concept. Uh, data presented in a meaningful context. The best example I have for you guys is you log into Access and you look at your timetable. It queried a database. If you're actually going to see the raw records, it would mean nothing to you. But it gives it to you in a nice little chart showing you know, with colors where your classes are. That's showing you data in a meaningful context. Data processed by summing, ordering, or averaging. You log into your bank app, you realize you have zero dollars left because you, you know, just bought like 25 packs of MTG cards. And you really shouldn't have done that today because now you have nothing to eat for the next three days, except for the wrappers for your magic cards. That's summing and ordering because it orders in the last transactions you did, that kind of stuff. Um, databases record data. They do such a way that we can produce information from the data. Example, student classes and grades will let you get us get us a, G, a GPA. GPAs are calculated. They're not created. Um, yeah, that's what they do. So database systems consist of four components. Users, database applications, DBMS, the database management system, and the database itself. Okay. Now, I'm going to go through these now, and I'm probably going to let me skip like five slides. Users. That's you and me, the teller at the bank. So for, I'm going to use the banking as, the, as a good example, okay? I log into my bank app. I am a user. The teller at the bank law is using her terminal to transfer money for you. She's a user. The bank manager man, giving you your student loan using their terminal. They're also a user. They're different kinds of users, but they're all users. The database application, that's the system that actually interacts, you interact with. So that would be, again, your banking app, the terminal application that a teller is using. Could be a number of other things. The database management system is what interfaces between the database application and the database itself. A database management system is Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL. And then the database is literally the structure with the data in it. The data itself is not portable. Like you can't take the files from MySQL and plop them in Microsoft SQL Server. That will not work. But you could export the structure from one, do a few little things to it, but I'm making it sound simple, and pop it into Microsoft SQL Server. You can port the database. The database management system determines what the file format is. Like you cannot look at the insides of a database file. It'll mean nothing. It's just binary garbage, as far as the human brain can see. The, the DBMS is what manages communication to the database. So application says, oh, we need to update the bank balance on this account. The database management system will take the command, do whatever it needs to do so we can modify the contents. We have SQL. Uh, that's what literally our second half of this term is going to be about. Uh, structured query language. Uh, it's also been called standard query language. Uh, it's an internationally recognized standard language used by pretty much all relational database systems. They're, most database servers, their SQL implementation is usually about 95%, 98% compatible with each other. They all have their own little things, but the, the core of SQL is pretty much the same everywhere, so which makes porting applications easy, even if you're using an ORM, it, it limits how much work the ORM needs to do. I work with an MVC framework. I know exactly what an ORM is. The database management system, like I just said, it sits in between. The database, database application is what you interact with. So this slide's really out of date. Um, when I first started working in 96, this was the brand new thing. Before that, when somebody interacted with a database, they were using a dumb terminal, right? They had this green screen thing, and the computer didn't have a hard drive. It barely had any RAM. It was literally a serial connection right to a server. You typed in shit. It was literally as you're typing, and it's showing up on the screen. It's actually the server telling you that it's on the screen. It wasn't a terminal doing it. This new thing came out called client server application. So you'd write an application. The application ran on the person's computer, so it reduces the workload on the server, and it would just send, here's the data. 
server would say, okay, good, it worked. No, it did. Oh, here's the new data. All it did is the server would serve up data. And then a little bit later, they added SQL into it. So suddenly we could use SQL to write all our commands. Cool. But the concept didn't really change that much. Now things have changed dramatically because now everything is in a web browser. And this is where, you know, people talk about how technology advances and it's always, you know, better, fancier, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know what a web browser is? It's a dumb terminal. It's literally a dumb terminal. Like you got a page, you click on a button, it fires off a command that gets processed by the server. The server set tells you what happened. The dumb terminal, you type some keys, it's sent to the server. The server will tell you what happened and tell, then show it to you. Really, we went back to how it was in the 60s and 70s, except now it's pretty. That's literally the difference. Either our dumb terminals are smarter than the old dumb terminals. That's all. And actually, I can't even say that because when I first started working, the dumb terminals I was working on actually supported client-side scripting. So the server would actually send like small chunks of code that you could be executed locally. So it could do data validation. Like, oh, you made sure that you had these six fields filled out before sending it to the server to reduce how much work. Terminals were made by IBM. It was using a language called Rex. But it was really cool. I mean, this was, this was at the end of that when I started working with them. Like I learned about these in school. I worked at a company where they had some of them and they showed me how it worked and they said, oh, by the way, we're not doing this anymore, but here's how it works. And I realized that's so cool. I thought to myself. And then five years later, I'm like, I got a web browser with JavaScript. I'm like, shit, we're right back to where we were. <laughs> All right, applications that are computer programs. Okay, I've already talked about this. All right, so sample multi-user database systems, um, a CRM and an ERP, a CRM and customer relation management systems, some of you have, may have heard of salesforce.com. Usually last group, not a single person heard of them. Um, this college here, for example, uses Salesforce to track all the incoming students. Uh, you know, you get all that nice marketing material from the college. That's because they have you in the CRM. Um, ERP is an accounting system. It's just a fancy accounting system. So. Uh, QuickBooks, Sage, uh, any of those kinds of things. If ever you've worked where you actually had to do, you know, uh, financial transactions, that's ERP. E-commerce companies, obviously. Uh, reporting and data mining. Um, it does not generate new data. It just summarizes and it's used for predicting future things. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys get a an elective called business intelligence. Um, it's a really interesting elective to take. Um, there's a lot of jobs in BI. Um, it's not an exciting course, I'll be honest, but it's an interesting course. You know, sometimes there's like, really like, there's like, it's not exciting, but it's interesting. As in, it's a good skill set to have, especially if you like working with data. If you don't like working with data, then it's not a good course for you. But if you like working with data, it's it's worth signing up as your elective. It's not an easy course. I'm warning you now. It's not easy. Um, at least the prof that was teaching it was pretty strict with her grading. But it's it's worth learning. Like I know Health Canada currently was looking for because uh, I have a I have a contact at Health Canada and they were looking for uh, 16 new BI graduates for here in Ottawa. So not co-op, literally like like full-time jobs. No, but being qualified for the job, which taking the course helps you be qualified, right? Not just taking that course, but having knowledge of business intelligence, that's, you know, a good course to have. So, all right, so these are some samples. Um, I always skip the first one because nobody does that anymore. Uh, the second example is a medical office, shows that you got 15 to 20 users, probably has 100,000 rows of data. Most doctor's offices, they just have a piece of software, they pay someone to come and install, set up all the computers and magically stuff happens. Um, CRMs, usually used for sales and marketing. Um, often it'll have you know 500 users or more, millions of rows. Microsoft has one, Oracle has one, Salesforce, Sugar CRM. Those are the big ones. Uh, ERP, 
Um, that's a complete organization. The company I work for right now has about 5,500 employees worldwide. And I think a thousand of them are on SAP. They use SAP in one way, form or another. Um, millions of rows. SAP is the biggest ERP system available, but Microsoft also has one called Dynamics. You know, there's different vendors that do the same thing. E-commerce sites, we know there's millions of users. For example, back to Amazon. The second you bought, so actually no, not even the second you bought, the second you went on Amazon, you clicked on the first page, you're a user. Even if you didn't buy shit, it knows what you looked at. You're a user, you're supplying information. They, they, Amazon has 22 different database products. You have to use the right tool. They have like five different NoSQL services. And they've got uh, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, Aurora versions of MySQL, and an Aurora version of Postgres as relational services that you can use. Those are cost 25. The Aurora ones are expensive. The other ones are like 25 bucks a month, depending which tier you buy. Um, digital dashboards. Um, I'm going to put data mining and digital dashboards together because they basically go hand in hand. You usually don't have a lot of users, but you'll have a lot of data behind it. Managers need a lot of data to make decisions. They'll look at the summary of the reports. The data miners are going to crawl through the millions and millions of rows of data to create the data that produces the dashboards. So realistically, data mining, digital dashboard, ERP, and CRM, it's all together. They, 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 they leak into each other all the time. That's just how it is. So a basic function of an application, uh, you create and process forms. A good example, okay, how many of you in the last month have filled out an online registration form of some sort? If Anybody who doesn't raise their hand is probably lying because you probably had to fill one out for the school. I'm just saying, you probably had to fill something out for the school that asked you for your name, your phone number, your email, something like that. And it was probably on a web page. Therefore, it's a form. The application generated the form. When you hit the submit button, it receives the form and processes it. That's an application. It processes user queries. You log into Access. You want to look at your timetable. It's running a query to tell you what your classes are. Execute problem application logic and control the application itself and create reports. Those are just basically, you know, the application is just doing its thing. So, for example, uh, on Amazon, you can't see, you can't log in as an administrator because it's controlling what you can do. But you can log into your own account kind of thing. Okay. I tried to replace this slide because this slide's so out of date. But the problem was that there's no real data to actually go with these numbers. And this was actually based on an actual research, but it's an old one. But we're gonna go, we're gonna roll with it. So this is a, a chart that talks about what percentage of companies using a given database product. And you'll notice that everything is a freaking range. Microsoft SQL Server, 60 to 90% of companies use Microsoft SQL Server. Yeah. Um, because sometimes you install an accounting package like QuickBooks and it installs Microsoft SQL Server with it. So they're using MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, congratulations. Just because you're, it's not something that you went out of your way to install doesn't mean you're not using it. So a lot of business systems use Microsoft SQL Server. Oracle, 40 to 80%. And that's like a, such a weird long range. And here's why, Oracle sales have been flat for 10 years. Oracle, Oracle's user base count has not gone up and not gone down in 10 years. They are making billions of dollars a year fleecing their existing customers. No, it's not Java, it's Oracle database. The thing is, is once you're in Oracle, it's almost impossible to get off Oracle. It's not because it's a good product. Well, it's a good product. It's good, it does what it's supposed to do. And it's been around for a long time, so it's very mature. It's just that once you're locked into the Oracle ecosystem, it's really hard to get out of the Oracle ecosystem. So it's cheaper to keep paying the maintenance fees than to pay a million dollars developer time 
for three years. Well, you're still paying the maintenance fees. And then you're still going to pay the maintenance fees for a while because you can't retire it right away. So Oracle makes its money on its existing customers. <clears throat> MySQL, 80%. I, that's a lie. That should be 100%. MySQL is the athlete's foot of the database world. It is everywhere. If the company you're interacting with has a website, there's a 90% chance it's running off MySQL. MySQL is around because it used to be easy to install, easy to use. And I'm putting air quotes around the word easy. It was never a good product. But the reason we use it and we teach it is because it's everywhere. We cannot, it's free. Doesn't mean it's good. It's just free. I would never run financials on my SQL. Not if my life depended on it. I'd quit my job before I'd run financials on my SQL. Unless it was running in, on AWS. Because it's AWS's problem. At that point, it's not your problem anymore. And even then, I'd be like, yeah. IBM DB2. IBM DB2 has low numbers. But those numbers lie. Because IBM DB2 runs the financial world. Their number one customer is banks. Why? IBM DB2 runs on mainframes. It runs, they make a version of DB2 for Android. They make it for Windows, they make it for Linux, they make it for Mac OS. They also make it for Z series mainframes. You can write code that works on your phone and on the mainframe. You're never going to want to do it on your phone. But it was, I don't know if they, I don't know if they still offer, but it was a thing at one point. It was cool. Proof of concept. IBM DB2 is super powerful. It's actually honestly more powerful than Oracle. But it's niche. Like banks will buy computers that cost a million dollars. They get DB2 for free with that. You know, it's basically included in the OS. Postgres at 15%. This is the one that's actually a bit of a lie because Postgres in the last five years has just... And one of the big reasons Postgres is picking up is it's 95% compatible with Oracle. It's programming language, its default programming language is 98% compatible with Oracle. It offers... 95% of what Oracle offers free. Governments are switching to it. As they're getting off Oracle, they're moving to it. For example, national uh, the GIS program here at the school for the Canada DND, the National uh, National Defense. The Canadian military uses Postgres for their geo mapping systems. For G GIS. And they're free. And it'll run on a potato. Not really. Postgres will run on a potato. The administration tools are like absolute pigs, but Postgres will run on a potato. Um, my company I work for, we're a Postgres shop. We do everything on Postgres. It's it's amazing. It does everything you want it to do. I'd run financial systems till the cows come home on that any day of the week. Um, for those of you that are curious, U of O runs a Postgres conference every year. Runs for for four days. Students get in for like almost for almost nothing. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's called PGCon. Go figure. But it's, you know, it's big. Then you got the non-relational ones. You'll see the numbers are really low. Uh, everybody thought it was a great thing. And then when they first came out, then they realized that it was really specific use case. Because it was literally like going back to the 1960s. Because in the 1960s, you accessed your data, you wrote code that accessed the data. And it accessed the data. When you use a NoSQL data, a non-relational database, you write code to access the data. You don't use SQL. You're actually writing code to access the data. The ORM fools you into thinking you're writing SQL. You're not. It's literally going back to the 60s technologically. It's just it, it's fancy now because it uses something called JSON. They just change how the format of the data is, but it's the same concepts. It's just I'm just saying that things have not changed. So you'll see the percentages are low uh, because they're very unique purpose. Uh, they're usually used as cash. Um, yeah, 
they're, they're very good at those things because it's unstructured data. Okay, database applications. Um, actually, I already talked about this. So the DBMS layer, these are the pieces that are involved there. So it allows you to create database, create the tables, create the supporting structures as applicable. Uh, it does something called CRUD, which is create, read, update, and delete. Um, maintain the database structure, enforces rules, concurrency, and backup. This course will be stopped there. This is a totally different kind of, you're going to be learning a bit about, a little bit about that next semester. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a whole course onto itself. Database admin. Access, I don't know why they keep putting this slide in this, but access is a database. Uh, it's another one of those products that, you know, I a lot of us in the industry keep thinking that it's going to die. And then they release a new version of Office. And yes, access is still there. Um, access is really good for what it's supposed to do, which is a single user database. You want to track all your Pokemon cards, create yourself an access database. You want to track all your magic cards, do that. You want to track every figurine on your shelf, that's for you too. The second more than one person tries to use the access database, that's where the, it shits the bed and everything goes wrong. Access is not meant to be multi-user. Although access does have one cool trick. Um, so access will do entry forms for you. It'll create the reports for you. It'll actually generate the queries for you. It'll do a lot of that for you. It'll do the form processing for you. It's like, you don't have to write code. You can just literally say, here's the table, make me a form. Bang, you've got a form. And it'll do first record, next record, blah, blah, blah. It'll do it all for you. You don't have to code anything if you don't want to. One of the cute tricks it has is you can actually use external databases. So you can connect to Microsoft SQL Server or to Oracle and use access as an interface to those systems for people. Is that a good idea? No, but you can. It's a very low point of entry. I mean, when I went through school, my first database course was with something called DBase. DBase 4. That was around before Access. Access was like a brand new, Access 1.0 had just come out. So DBase was what Access was before. They're really good prototyping. You want to roughly generate what the UI should look like. You can do it in Access pretty quick. Like you can drop some fields, blah, blah, drag and drop. Then you can say, I want it to kind of look like this. Then you give that to your designer. The designer says, okay, this is what we're going to make the web page look like. And then it looks like nothing like you did in Access because now it's fancy. But, you know, Access is a thing. On the other hand, you've got enter cl enterprise class database systems. So that's basically everything but Access. I am going to include MySQL in there, kind of, and MariaDB in there, kind of. If you're using it in a cloud provider like Azure or Amazon, then it's enterprise. If it's running on your Linux server on a old beat up HP in the server room, it's not enterprise. You'll have all kinds of things in this. You've got the application running, like a client application. You've got e-commerce app running on a web server. You've got a portal for the managers. Uh, XML web services, that's still a thing. I wish it wasn't, but it's still a thing. Uh, mobile apps, they all talk to, each of those things will generate SQL that goes through the database management system that then farms out. And we're almost finished. God, it's getting hot in here. Um, there's three types of database design. Well, there's, yeah, that's basically three. You got, from existing data, this one doesn't happen very much anymore. This was a big thing in the early 80s to early 90s. These were all these corporations that still did everything on paper that need to modernize. So they would, you'd have all these forms, all these, you know, documents that they have, and you'd take all that stuff, do some analysis on it, extract the data, and generate a database structure based on what they had. That still happens, but not very much. Um, you'll have new systems development. That one's the fun one. That's a blank room implementation. So somebody went on a vision quest. They said, I have this great idea for a product. They list out the requirements. Then you do some analysis. You create some models. You turn the model into a database design. Um, that's where, this is the one where you get to be creative. Like, it's, you know, it gets the creative juices flowing. But it's like, 
anything else though, this one has its own pitfalls. Like the first one's problematic because you're dealing with like actual like crusty information. This one's difficult because how many of you have ever built something and then you're finished and you got a part left in your hand? Because you missed a step, you forgot a piece. When you're designing an application from scratch, especially a database, you think you've got it. And then you're just about done and somebody says, oh, well, what about that? And we're like, oh crap. And that's, that's happened to me a few times. I mean, 26 years, it's bound to happen, right? Yeah, or the, the end users suddenly start using it in a way you didn't expect. So new system development's fun. It lets you be creative, but it's really easy to miss something. As the more experience you gather, the less things you're going to miss, but it's still going to miss things. Database redesign. So you've got a couple of old databases, old systems they want to bring, modernize and bring together. You might be merging two or three systems together. You might be reverse engineering an existing database that you're not actually allowed to use, but you can get the data out of it, but you're not allowed to actually use the database structure. So you're going to pull, dump the data and reverse engineer it from there. That's a redesign. That one's really tedious. It can be interesting. But it can be dangerous and tedious, boring, because you're just going to sit there and do one million rows later, you're like, crap, there's an exception. So it happens. Okay, so the structured design life cycle, this is similar to the software development life cycle, but specific to database. You will assess the needs. You'll do feasibility analysis. So you're gonna see, is this something that we can actually do? You're gonna generate alternatives. Now, generating alternatives is an interesting one because a lot of people, you'll have a boss saying, we want to do this. And they're going to come up with, you know, some physics. okay, well, I think we can do this. And then we'll say, okay, we can do it like this, this, or this. But often what people don't do is they don't go look in the market and see if there's something similar. That is 95% as good as what the boss wants. The generating alternatives part really should also include you going to do some market research to see if you can find something that's close enough. And then you evaluate the alternatives and you choose a solution. As part of the alternative evaluation, you'll look at, okay, we yes, we have the, the skills in-house, we can do this. So it's gonna take three engineers at $90,000 a year, two years to do this. Okay, so $270,000 or no, three, whatever it is. Okay, 27, yeah, 27, $270,000 a year times three years. Or we could buy this piece of software at seventy thousand dollars. When they first come up and say, "Oh, that software is seventy grand," they're like, "Oh, that's expensive." And all the bean counters go, "Oh, my, 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 my money." And then you go, "But if we do it ourselves, it's going to cost this over the next three years." Yes, it'll probably be maybe as good, but more precise to what we want. Whereas the one that's commercial is probably better, more usable but it might not do everything you want. Then can you actually get the commercial one and pay them, I don't know, 50 grand to add on what you want? It's still gonna be cheaper than paying your developers. And it's probably gonna come with training and come with tech support. And so there's ongoing costs when you do it yourself, right? So eventually somebody will do the, will choose something, then some design happen. Whether you're buying an off the shelf product or not, there's still some design happening. You're gonna develop and test, you're gonna implement, you're gonna evaluate, take the results of evaluation, see if there's new needs, assess them. Around the circle you go again. Take it as someone who's been doing this for a long time, it never ends. There is no end, especially if it's an in-house developed product, there is no end. There's, there's slow times, but it never ends. Like I'm still updating code and a database that I created almost 20 years ago. It's mission critical. Like literally that database disappears, the company just is done. But we're still adding to it. Slowly, gently, very gently. Oh yeah, yeah oh, it's happened. It's happened. It's where one thing went wrong because somebody put a semicolon in the right, wrong place. It happens. It's web-based code. So literally you just upload the file and everything shits the bed. So, you know, it is what it is. Now, this is the, the cycle. There's also 
the old way we used to look at it, which is the waterfall, which is the exact same steps. Except usually this view was when you're a consultant. Because you get hired, you go through all these steps, you deliver the product, and then you're done. You hope. Professional services is the next victim. But you develop, you, design, you, you drop it off, you evaluate if it worked, you take that evaluation, you assess some new needs, you might do one more round, and then they're done paying you and you're done. So it's not a cycle, it's literally a waterfall. All right, so I will be putting up an announcement with what you guys should be reading. It'll probably be up tomorrow. Um, make sure you start reading the hybrids so you can take the quiz when they come up. And make sure you finish your assessments because, well, it's a shitty way to fail because you didn't do anything. And that's the end for today. So I will see you guys here next week and or in lab on Tuesday. As applicable. <laughs>